let us today, young and old, join together as did the First Continental Congress in humble, heartfelt prayer. Let us do so for the love of God and His great goodness, in search of His guidance and the grace of repentance. Let's pray today. Heavenly Father, we come to you at a time when our nation is in deep peril. Our nation has kicked you out of our schools, kicked you out of our public square, and kicked you out of our government. Forgive us, O oh God, for your word declares the nation whose God is the Lord, that nation is blessed. The foundation that was laid through the sacrifice of our founding fathers is losing its footing. Our great nation has turned its face away from you. Our eyes have turned toward our own way. We've leaned on our own understanding, and the results have been disastrous morally and economically. Forgive us. Help us to turn back to your ways, which are true, right, just, and holy. Lord, we know our political systems are in disarray, and we are turning on one another in anger and hate instead of turning to you, to your guidance, wisdom, and love. Lord God, we pray right now for forgiveness for ourselves and our personal actions. And we ask that Jesus forgive us for whatever sins we've personally done in our life. We also come to you to ask forgiveness on our homes and our families. And we believe in our hearts that you have the ways and means to change the minds, thoughts, and hearts of those in power. And those who make the decisions that affect our very lives. Father, we call out in prayer as a voice for our cities and towns and our nation so that the leaders will honor you and your holy word. We ask for a revival of faith to sweep over our nation, in our churches, our places of business, in our schools, our homes, and in the White House. We ask and believe that you will not only intervene, but that you will raise up a holy army to stand in the gap an army of warriors who will stand on the front lines of our local government all the way to Washington for a fight for truth, justice, and liberty. We pray for each leader that is upholding the Constitution of these United States of America, strengthen them, and protect them. We pray for our military, our men and women who lay down their lives daily for our freedoms. Cover them. Be their shield and strength against those who hate our way of life. We specifically pray against the radical Islamic extremists and any other terrorist organization that has its sights on destroying our nation. We come before you in prayer and ask that your protection will go beyond the natural realm and move supernaturally on our behalf. Lead and guide our police departments and our law enforcement agencies. Lord, be our guiding light once again. Help us to look to you as our source. We entrust the United States of America to your loving care. One nation, under God we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Pastor Webb, uh, the pastor uh, speaks over at New Birth Church in Thorndike. Anyone from the area, I recommend you uh, stop out. As uh, if there's anything we need in this country, it's more of the Word of God. Um, we're going to pick up next, uh, quite traditionally, with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to invite the president of the Swift River Sportsman's Club, uh, Big Ray, to come on up and do those honors for us, if you would.
right. Thank you, Ray. Um, I guess I'd like to start out setting the tone for today's event and uh, and maybe going into a little history of uh, the Flag Day Second Amendment rally. Is it's kind of an interesting one in itself. Um, I see a lot of faces out here from two years ago. It was the first one we did. It started out as a small fundraiser for our, our Republican town committee. And um, it was kind of interesting as we were told by many of the uh, political types and uh, um, the up and coming politicians that just having a rally just about the Second Amendment without having an agenda full of candidates and politicians was an absolute failure. What you doing, son? No one's going to go. No one cares. Says you got to get our candidates on there. Where's Scott Brown? Where's Where's Gabriel Gomez? Come on. Where Where are these characters we need to hear from? And I resisted, and I loaded the the, the agenda up with people like uh, we got a return speaker, Mr. Larry Kraft from Gun Owners of America. He spoke. Mr. Mike Vanderbilt, remember the gentleman that uh, exposed the Fast and Furious scandal? Well, people wanted to hear what Mr. Vanderbilt had to say. They came out in numbers to see him, too. You know, we had several hundred people come through that day. Well, it was a, quite a success. And those naysayers that told me that I was uh, planning a failure co-opted it last year. There was a, another Flag Day Second Amendment rally. And it was done by a couple of the people on my own state committee woman, an up and coming uh, rhino. Let's see, us Republicans are us constitutional conservative types refer to the establishment Republicans as rhinos, as Republicans in name only, as they, they call themselves Republicans, but they're really progressives. Um, so, yeah, they planned their own event. They stuffed their agenda full of candidates, they took it to another club. And I sent uh, a couple of my buddies went over there. About one o'clock in the afternoon, there was seven people there. Seven people. I couldn't believe it. So, needless to say, we uh, took back control. We've got some top-notch speakers. I have banned politicians from the agenda. There's not one politician. You're going to hear from the people that count. These, uh, these politicians and candidates, they've all been invited. I've asked them to come in, sashay their little carcasses in under the tent, sit down and listen. It's time for these people to stop running their mouths. We can go to their offices and their campaign sites and be lied to any time. It's their turn to sit down and listen. We've got to start asking the right questions. You know, why are we going in there? Why are you stealing our rights? Why are you doing that? Do you understand that as socialism? We're asking the wrong questions. And when it comes to the Second Amendment, the questions that I'm going to ask them are going to be similar to this. When I refuse to give up my guns, and I will, will I have a jury of my peers, or will I have some kind of a military tribunal? Will they come and arrest me to local peace officers? Or will they send some kind of a international militarized who knows what? Will the warrant come on a piece of paper or will they deliver it with a drone? I don't know. But it's going to come to that. What are you going to do when I say no? When you say no? That's what we got to do, you see. We're missing an awful lot in this country. And if our politicians want any talking points and they want to uh, improve their odds of winning, there's 10 things that they can do that would almost assure victory. And they're wrapped up in the Ten Commandments. So, so not lie, cheat, steal, so on and so forth. You know, we don't hear anything about that. Jesus being purged out of our dialect, out of our schools, out of the public arena. For a country that was born in, in Christian values, it's amazing what we've come to tolerate. Tolerance, it's a word that we hear all the time. My tolerance has been reached and exceeded. And it's about time, if we're going to have a discussion of tolerance, let's let them know it's been exceeded already. We're not tolerating anymore. We're here to say no today. 
All right. I've got a number of speakers here that are uh, hopefully going to be informative, going to keep you excited and, and engaged in what we're doing. The purpose of the event, the reason you see the mix of speakers that you do, is that you know you don't broke, you fix what's not broken. Our first event, uh, we thought long and hard about who we're going to have uh, before you to talk, and and we felt that having those national figures that have a, a message that's relevant to the whole nation that that was going to be inspiring to you and that you know we need to not leave these events get all fired up we all wave our flags then we go home and play on Facebook the idea is for each of you to turn around and look at the person next to you and across the table shake a hand and meet somebody because each one of you is here for a reason. Each one of you is an activist. I haven't, there's not a face here that I haven't seen before. You've got to meet each other. And as we network with the locals, with the state level speakers, we've got Christopher Pinto in here, Kirk Watley, Lynn Roberts. These people, they're organized and ready to, to go to work. They've proven themselves. And I'm asking you, each of you, to make sure that you stop by their tables Make sure that your name and email address shows up on their list so that they can contact you. These are people that I, I bump into in the state house doing the real work, and we need to get you involved. All right? And not everyone can go to Boston, but you know what? These Congress critters have local offices. And if this many people started knocking on your rep's door, letting them know they're serving potentially their last term in office, it counts. It absolutely counts. All right, well, I'd like to uh, jump right into things. We uh, got a late start today. We wanted to make sure uh, that folks that were coming in from across the state had the opportunity uh, to get here. And uh, we do have a couple of our speakers that are on the first half of the program. We gotta get on the plane, so um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but you're gonna get every bit out of every speaker, I promise you. I'll cut back my rhetoric just a little bit. All right, our... Uh, First speaker, uh, where is Mr. Brian Dalton? Brian Dalton. Brian Dalton. We are absolutely going to have to skip over Brian if you don't come up here pretty quick. <laughs> All right. We'll track him down, and we're going to get him back up here. Uh, as Brian is the president of the New England Firearms Academy, and uh, you hear him on the radio in Boston, WRKO, so we want to hear what he has to say. But um, I think we're going to jump right in uh, to one of our uh, keynote speakers. He's a return guest here at the rally, and I'm sure you've seen him. He has been on just about every news network. He has written numerous books, and he is the go-to guy at the national level for Second Amendment issues and gun rights. And that is Mr. Larry Pratt, he is the Executive Director Emeritus of Gun Owners of America. 1.5 million members strong. Yeah. I would like to have Mr. Pratt. Patriots. Hey. Hopefully that's still permitted to address people that way. Uh, I'm sure the NSA will have a copy and we can discuss it next week. I think I'm probably talking like an echo chamber about Orlando to this group, but I did so many media appearances this last week. But I just wanted to make sure that maybe there's one person in here that didn't realize that in Orlando, that was like the crown jewel of gun control that went kaput. It just didn't pass muster. And it wasn't the fact that the dirtbag was able to get a gun uh, that he actually passed a background check, uh, which in and of itself uh, is interesting because it shows that their efforts are futile. But where he chose to operate was a place where he assumed that 
the good guys would behave themselves and obey the law even while he planned to break it six ways from Sunday. The dirt bag chose a place that under Florida state law was a gun free zone. And uh, yeah, somebody asked, how's that working out? Um, well, for dirt bags, it's a gift that keeps on giving. They always seem to go to these places. They may be evil as all get out, but they aren't stupid. And we know that all but one, two of our mass murders in our country have now occurred in gun-free zones. Oh, but I guess we got to wait until we get some more evidence, maybe some scientific studies before we do anything, right? Uh, it's just really stunning that it's like that lazy hound dog who just sits on a nail and it hurts and he keeps howling and he never moves. And that seems to be the way our legislators are. The people are howling, but the legislators don't have any interest uh, in, I guess, admitting that they had such a failure that they are responsible for. And this has been going on such a long time. Uh, some of you may recall Susanna Gracia, now Susanna Gracia Up. She was having lunch with her parents at Luby's Cafeteria back in the, I'll say early 90s. I'm not even sure. It's been a long time. And all of a sudden, uh, a dirt bag runs through the wall of the cafeteria and his truck gets out and begins to gun people down, including her mother and father. And when she went to the legislature subsequently to testify, she looked those buzzards right in the eye and said, the blood of my parents and the other victims at Luby's are on your hands because they didn't have a gun with them. I had left my gun in the truck so I wouldn't break a law so that I wouldn't lose my chiropractic license. And I lost my parents instead because of your law. That's the reality of gun control. That's what happens when we listen to these people. Hopefully you're getting the idea that maybe it's a good idea to ignore gun control. They don't have an electronic security system and they're not patting you down. The bad guy is certainly not going to leave his gun in his truck. Just Susanna Gracia Huff. And she's got dead parents to reflect on the wisdom of complying with a truly vicious and immoral law. The, uh, there's even some questions, and maybe we'll get answers to these questions about Orlando. But we really, we have to assume there were a lot of, a lot of bullets that were shot. How did he get all those in there? Was the guy, uh, uh, you know, did he have magazines up and down his leg inside his pants? Um, what, how did it happen? We don't know. That, that's a question that still really hasn't been answered. Um, apparently, a lot of the victims were unable to get out of the exit doors. Were they closed by evilly intended people, or were they closed, as some have said, by victims who didn't want the bad guy to pursue them out the door, thus trapping inside uh, other more victims. There's no pictures from inside the club that I know of. Maybe you've seen some. I'd love to see them. But in this day and age, there's a picture of everything. It's uncanny how many events turn up being photographed I'm not even worried when I go to the bathroom, you know, somebody's <laughs> surveil that. And yet there's no pictures coming out of Orlando. It, another question. I, I honestly don't have an answer, I'm not suggesting, but it's taken a long time before some of these very obvious questions to ask uh, are still being unanswered. Um, Jumping into the fray, uh, to be predicted, were some of the advocates of gun control. And the Washington Post uh, participated in the melee, and they ended up kind of punching themselves out. They, they said that uh, 
Orlando happened because you could buy machine guns over the counter. Well, I'd like to know where you can buy a machine gun over the counter. Because I'm heading over there. And I realize I'll have to go to the bank first because I want to do this with a lot of cash. But uh, really, you can do that. That's good news. You should be able to. Yes. But I don't think that's what's happening. Um, then they said uh, more gun control has led to less crime. And you might want to check out the people who live in Chicago and other places like that before you go too far with that argument. But they actually seriously made that statement. It's as if they really do live in a bubble and they expect you and me to live under the same terms. Of course, we don't have the security guards and systems that they have. And, uh, oh, then they said the crime went up when the semi-auto ban ended. Well, apparently they haven't checked the data because crime had been going down before the ban, during the ban, and after the ban. And in the last 20 years, violent crime has actually gone down over the 20 years, even though more of us, you know, irresponsible people like you and me, have bought guns, more of us have bought multiple guns, as well as newbies buying guns, and crime keeps going down. Violent crime keeps going down. It's got to be very frustrating to be a liberal anti-gunner. But they seem to be able, they're resilient. They don't give up. And in spite of the facts, they keep coming back. Um, there are some things that you would think might give them some pause. And as I say, the facts just seem to roll off. Then like water off a duck's back. 130 people were killed in Paris. The whole country is a gun-free zone, essentially. And that's a pretty accurate statement. And so the dirt bags that killed the people had guns that hopefully most of us have in our closet, but you can't buy them over the counter, you can't buy them legally in, in France at all. It's just not possible. And then somehow the bad guys got guns. How did that happen? Didn't they know they were against the law? It's just... And so, the, um, the other thing that they don't seem to want to have to deal with is that the semi-automatic firearms, the so-called assault weapons, are a, really a very small part of the violent death toll in this country, criminal violent death. Uh, they don't get it. Uh, but any excuse when you want to do something is better uh, than no excuse at all. And so they'll use any excuse at all. That's what these people are up to. They have an agenda and that's all that matters. And our lives don't matter. They, they simply really don't care. They want us to be disarmed. And Clearly, it's not just that some of them are goody two shoes and have, an, have a phobia about guns, which some do. But what we're really dealing with is a lot more sinister than that. We're talking about people like Senator Schumer, who are sinister, who are very smart, very intelligent people, who want us disarmed because they know that if you're going to try to take out uh, a bunch of ranchers like the Bundys, Finnegan, uh, if you're going to uh, go against individual Americans, we're armed. And that gives them pause and they hate it. They don't like to deal with that. And thus the, the, the ridiculing of people who own guns uh, and the conservative gun-owning part of the population following Orlando has been routinely referred to as terrorists. Now, this is probably as likely a group for them to label terrorists as any. And all I can tell them is, um, you can even take your depends off. Nothing's going to happen here. I can assure you that as soon as a bad guy starts to misbehave, it won't last long. Not in a place like this. But what they're used to are places like the bar in Orlando, 
where people are disarmed by law. And that's where the target rich environments are. Those are murder zones. Those are legislative murder zones. And it, it, Then, uh, I guess the ultimate uh, insult that's been attempted, uh, and it's been echoed by many, came from our dearly beloved former president, William uh, Jefferson Paula Clinton. Um, and this uh, paradigm of virtue and patriotism uh, said that it was the gun carriers uh, in Orlando who made it worse. Really? I, honestly, I, I, was, I missed that one because I thought it was the fact that only the, the murderer had a gun in a gun-free zone. Uh, but there's Bill Clinton telling us what we missed. So, no wonder he was president. He's a lot smarter than the rest of us. Um, this, this gun control mentality in the United States is part and parcel with Marxism. His dear wife, that you may see once in a while, I'm not sure, um, is a Marxist anti-gunner right to the core. This is a gal who wrote a senior thesis at Wellesley College. God help us if any of our children and grandchildren go to such a school. Um, and in that thesis, uh, she praised Saul Alinsky one side, up, down, the other. And her only criticism of Saul Alinsky, whose objective was to tear down, bring down, implode, uh, really, the, the government of the United States, kind of, a, you may have heard of the Clower Piven strategy with a couple of Harvard, so, uh, Columbia sociologists that talked about, as did, Clint, as did Alinsky and Clinton, overloading the system so that it collapses, and that all the dependent people that have been dependent on the system can be counted upon to have a right and finish off the, the system with that kind of disruption. The only criticism that Hillary Clinton had of Alinsky was that his revolutionary model was too limited. <laughs> he only saw how you could take the government down from an outside attack like Black Lives Matter, something out on the streets, something where you challenge the system and there's a confrontation with the cops and so forth. And Clinton's genius, if you can call it that, is that she saw that also was needed because the system was able to resist just a res an attack from the outside. What was needed was an attack from within. And hence she became an attorney and started to burrow into the system as an attorney to tear it down, along with lots of other attorneys who have done the same thing. Hillary Clinton comes from a city that has a long, long history of left-wing politics and gun control. It's the city of Mayor Washington, perhaps the first communist to be a mayor of a major city uh, in the United States. Um, he was celebrated because he happened to be black, uh, but a real concern was the fact that his politics were very red. Um, she um, came from the city of Mayor Jane Byrne, who back in the 80s instituted a ban on handguns. And she admitted that that was ultimately a bad idea because then it led to people having handguns that they didn't know anything about and they're all about knowing everything about us and from her point of view it was a failure from the point of view of people trying to defend themselves in Chicago uh, it was irrelevant because they were going to get a gun anyway no matter what they don't understand that that's not the way the left thinks uh, they really are convinced, and I'm, I've debated enough of them, that there are a bunch of them, it's not even an act, they really believe that there are people that are so superior that they should be making the decisions for all of us. There should be a concentration of power 
and they should be the ones exercising it. There's another word for that, it's called totalitarianism, it's called dictatorship, but that's where they're coming from, and that's where Hillary Clinton is coming from. This woman is a self-conscious, committed enemy of the United States who wants to destroy the country. That's her mission in life. Um, the hypocrisy of the gun control people is legion, and we don't really have enough time to consider all of them, but I would offer at least as some evidence for what I'm saying. Senator Schumer, who doesn't think any of us here should have a gun, travels with men who are very well armed and goes about Washington with men and women who are very well armed. Um, and he's hardly an exception. Hillary Clinton obviously has Secret Service protection for life because the guy that played the part of her husband uh, is entitled to it and so is she, by law. And the kids, it's expensive. It's a good thing she only had one. More ways than one. Um, because the one she had, just like mom, um, the the um, the idea that I've had for these folks, and, and I enjoy presenting it to the media types, it, such a good idea for an average American to be disarmed, then you convince Hillary Clinton, Senator Schumer, and the others that are calling for disarmament have them lead by example. Amen. Right? Kind of in the same tone of voice as Ronald Reagan in Berlin. Mr. Schumer, leave those guns at home! <laughs> but lead by example. That's, uh, that's where we will not find any of the liberals not out in front, not leading by example, but directing. They lead from behind. I think that's probably where our president got that. Um, I want to do a little bragging. Harry Reid was complaining about the gun lobby this week. Maybe some of you saw that. Um, happily, he's had occasion to complain fairly often over recent years, and he said, the NRA is bad, but that gun owners of America, they're worse than bad. <laughs> bad. <laughs> bad and uh, and Not only should we be known by our friends, but I guess I would say I'd like to be known by my enemies. And uh, Senator Reid, uh, we'll have a check in the mail on Monday. 